London. Christmas Day 1922, 24-year-old Elsie Cameron gets the gift she's been longing for for years, a marriage proposal from her 22-year-old boyfriend, Norman Thorne. Her answer was an emphatic yes as her family cheered on because they too were extremely ecstatic, but not necessarily why you would think. Because you see, Elsie came with mental health issues that weren't readily apparent to Norman at the time, which is believed to be signs of neurosis, basically meaning she felt extremes of such emotions as guilt, envy, anger, jealousy, which would often leave her in a state of anxiety or depression when these emotions overcame her. Her family had been secretly dealing with hysterical fits and a plethora of nervous disorders behind closed doors. So here we get an idea of why Elsie's family was so joyous about Norman's proposal, because they were just weary of taking care of her, and Norman was their godsend, their patsy, effectively, that would take her off their hands. And so they would press Norman when he would set that wedding date, but Norman though having a good job as an engineer, didn't yet feel financially steady enough to offer that date. And as he made Elsie wait, as the months went on, she became anxious and paranoid. Cracks in her personality would become more apparent, and with an eyebrow raised, Norman became a bit more reluctant about marrying her. But he chose to ignore all the red flags, so to speak. Nor did he have the heart to not only disappoint Elsie, but her entire family. But it was this lack of cojones, even as he stared in the face of crazy, that would cost both of them their lives. But this was no Romeo and Juliet. As they say, reality is definitely stranger than fiction. So as the British economy took a turn for the worse, as the entire world was heading towards a depression, Norman lost his job as an engineer, which made him postpone the wedding date indefinitely. But that did not stop Elsie or her clan from asking him about it every chance they got. No, he would reply. He needed to make sure he was able to take care of Elsie, so he had to think of making money. And to do so, He went quite the unconventional route indeed. He purchased a plot of land 50 miles out of the big city and into a small town called Crowborough. Starting from scratch, he was going to build himself a chicken farm. He traded in his suit and tie for overalls and chicken feed. He built the chicken coops himself. He built a rickety hut to live in. And he bought some chickens. This definitely was an inconvenience for his relationship with Elsie because Norman had only a bicycle. And for the first few weeks, he would bicycle into London to meet with Elsie, family, friends. But after a while, the 100-mile round trip grew tiresome. So a new excuse cropped up that his chicken farm wasn't doing very well and he had to tend to it even on the weekends. But Elsie, ever the worry ward, feeling that her fiancé was slipping through her fingers, said that she would take it upon herself to visit him, saving her wages as a typist and catching the train to Crowborough every other weekend to help him on the farm. As a year of this carried on, Elsie's impatience had worn incredibly thin, and it literally drove her mad that for the first six months of 1924, she had been under medical supervision. And unfortunately, in that final month that Elsie was getting better, in June of 1924, Norman had found someone else. One night, he decided to unwind from from his daily toils and treated himself to a local Crowborough dance. There, he was captivated by a dressmaker named Bessie, who was not like Elsie at all. She was free-spirited as Elsie was wound tight. She was always smiling as Elsie was serious. And when he was with her, he felt alive. So he asked her out, and she said yes. And Norman, to his credit, immediately wrote a letter to Elsie, admitting that he had found someone else and that there would be no wedding. Upon reading this letter, 
You could imagine Elsie having just overcome a breakdown was right at the cusp of another. But she was not about to let Norman go without a fight. She was going to take matters into her own hands, into her womb, so to speak. But she didn't think this plan through all too well at all. You know, mental issues and all. And you'll see why. Just a quick time out to show love to the people keeping the lights on. We just earned Uncool Dre as a new Patreon patron. Your support for me has always been amazing, Dre. I would raise a toast to you if I wasn't suffering from these itchy, itchy hives at the moment. So she takes the next train out to see Norman to tell him this extremely urgent news. That she was pregnant. And that they should set a wedding date to be as soon as possible. Now here's why her plan was not good especially to norman because he's pretty sure he's never had sex with her and this would only strengthen norman's decision to leave elsie as her neuroticism has become more and more apparent elsie begins to cry and frantically move about his hut with no end to her chaos in sight he decided to placate her by telling her that he will set a wedding date as soon as he consults with his father this seemed to work as Elsie calmed down and her frown turned upside down. But of course, Norman knew that this was just a temporary band-aid, that this wound required medical attention before he was able to fully start a life with Bessie. But he wasn't sure what his next move would be, so he simply carried on the chicken farm, adding Sunday school teacher to his weekends and spending all of his free time with Bessie. So after a few months of this, he again would write Elsie, confessing his love for another woman. But there was no getting through to Elsie as her condition worsened. She would simply write back as if everything was okay and she was still waiting patiently for the day that they were husband and wife. Kinda scary, huh? Well, it's about to get scarier. On December 5th of 1924, a very anxious, unstable Elsie boards a train to Crowborough, Sussex and heads to Norman's chicken farm. Though, Norman himself was unaware of this particular visit. And this would be the day that Norman's life ends. But not how you think. Let's pick up this story a few days after Elsie's visit. A letter arrives at Elsie's house and surprisingly, it was from Norman, wondering why Elsie had not made any plans to visit him at the farm. Elsie's family, who indeed were ready to be rid of her, did love her very much and this letter from Norman was terrifying as they believed she was with him all this time. They report Elsie missing to the authorities who of course went straight away to question one Mr. Norman Thorne. Norman told the police that she had never reached his chicken farm and that they were free to search the premise because he had nothing to hide. The police did believe Norman's sincere concern as he was a Sunday school teacher and a well-liked chicken farmer. They did a quick cursory search of his farm and found nothing of interest, bid Norman good day and went to go question the neighbors who also saw nothing. It was when Elsie was missing for an entire month was it quite clear that she might never return. Detectives continued to mull over the case as it started to grow cold. But it was when they were contacted by Norman's neighbors did some luck finally go their way. See, these neighbors were questioned back when they visited Norman the first time and they didn't see anything. But fortunately, as they rehashed the situation with a couple of their hired hands, the hands were actually working the day of December 5th and they remembered seeing a woman fitting Elsie's description on Norman's farm. With this information, the police decided to up the search a notch and started poking and digging around Norman's farm again, but with a bit more fervor. And then they were able to unearth an overnight bag, as well as other items that would later be identified as belonging to the missing Elsie 
Cameron without a proper explanation as to why these things would be buried on his land. He was arrested on January 14 of 1925. With Norman's back securely against the wall, he decides to come clean. He explained his relationship with Elsie, the proposal, how it was a mistake, that being the spineless coward that he was, wasn't able to break Elsie's heart, him falling in love with Bessie, in which he said he confessed to Elsie numerous times, and his inability to break up with her. When he gets to the fateful day of December 5th, he says that he was surprised to see Elsie in his hut when he came home. But this time, he made sure that she knew that he was in love with another woman. A woman that he was going to see right then after he changed his clothes. He leaves the hut with a distraught Elsie inside and goes to Bessie's house to have dinner with her and her parents. It was when he got home did he see Elsie had never left. She had taken a clothesline and hung herself on the beam of his hut. He said that the sight of Elsie hanging there put him into a state of panic. He immediately cut her down as his mind was in a cloud of disbelief. He felt that the world would not believe that she had killed herself, especially if they found out about his affair and pin all the blame on him. And he winds up doing something almost too idiotic to believe. So he doesn't call the police, dismembers her body, and buries her. He informs the police where they can find the remains. They find it. Now the evidence against Norman, though circumstantial, were pretty damning. One being that they found a newspaper clipping of the Crumbles murders, which in short contained bodies being dismembered and buried, which added premeditation to his motives. Next, being the beam of his home, in which he claimed Elsie hung herself on, appeared to have no marks, which would have been impossible according to professionals considering her weight and the ricketiness of his hut. They hung weights on the beam to prove their point and every trial it left a mark. But the most damning of all, the pathologist Sir Bernard Spilsbury. Do names like that still exist? Because that's spectacular. After examining Elsie's remains, not only were there no rope marks on her neck, but she appeared to have been beaten to death. On March 15, 1925, Norman Thorne was found guilty of murder. And this was big news at the time. It even caught the attention of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, of Sherlock Holmes fame, to come out and say on Norman's behalf that nothing about the evidence was proof beyond a reasonable doubt that Thorne had killed, or meant to kill, Elsie Cameron. But nonetheless, on April 22nd of 1925, just like how he claimed Elsie died, Norman was hanged in the Wandsworth prison in London. A fitting gift for Elsie Cameron, because that day coincidentally fell on her birthday. So do you guys think Norman did it? Or did Elsie's mental health get the best of her that day? Comment below because I'd love to hear your thoughts. I hope I earned your subscription for that story. We're getting close to 10k. If not, well how about just a like for the work. My name is Killian, telling true crime stories for my dad. I love you dad. And I'll be back again soon with another.